ich heute die vielen Flüchtlinge sehe, die in Deutschland When I see all the refugees arriving in Germany today, it reminds me of when we fled from Poland to the West when I was a child. How important it was then to not only find a place you could go, but also one where you'd be allowed to stay. Many of you are probably still worried about your families and other relatives. We no longer have a home. All the houses in Darea were destroyed. Mine, those of my children. We have nothing left in Syria, nothing at all. When the train arrived at the Friedland transit camp in 1947, it marked the beginning of a new life. That's why Friedland is almost like a birthplace to me. My name is Kinaz Al-Habal. I fled my home because of the war raging there. I lived with my children in Darea, near Damascus, which is where I come from. One day, when my grandson was leaving the mosque, he was shot in the back. He was taken to hospital. I feared for his life. The doctors weren't able to remove the bullet from his liver. It's still there. After that, my daughter, his mother, and her husband and their seven children fled to Lebanon. I was really worried about them. There were so many massacres taking place. People were being slaughtered. So many massacres. I lived in constant fear. You lost track of who was killing whom. You lose sight of the truth. The most frightening thing was having to dodge shells on the way to school to take my final exams. I was so afraid of getting hit by fragments. They can kill you. Later, I heard from our neighbours that our house had burnt down. Bombs were dropped from the sky on my house, my daughter's house, both my son's houses, my brother-in-law's. They were all destroyed. The regime had given us just one hour to leave our homes. At seven o'clock in the morning, we all fled Darea together. Barcelona, the government 
And right after we were gone, there was a massacre in Darea. Welcome to Friedland. I hope you'll be able to relax and get some rest here and gather strength for the next two weeks when you'll be our guests here. You've all been given a red sheet of paper that has a time written on it. All the best. See you on Monday. My name is Jabrail Adam. I come from Al Hasaka in northern Syria. We are Christian Assyrians. The war forced us to leave our home in Syria. It had become too violent. There were armed gangs and kidnappings. We escaped to Lebanon and stayed there for two years. We registered with the UN Refugee Agency, and that's how we managed to get to Germany. From the airplane, we could see that Germany is a very green and beautiful country. We hope we'll be allowed to stay and to work. We'd like to become independent. We don't want to be a burden on the German state. You know, there were Christians, Sunnis, Shiites, all living in our building. We all lived together, peacefully, side by side, like brothers. We didn't even know what denomination anybody was. We didn't ask whether our neighbors were Shiites, Alawites, or Sunnis. We just lived together in peace. My family and I were very happy in Syria. We led very contented lives. When the protests began, we were forced to flee. Our house was destroyed. It was hit by a shell. I don't know who did it, whether it was the government or the rebels. I did nothing wrong. Our children didn't support the regime. Or the revolution. We lived in the heart of Damascus. Our house was destroyed. Whenever she thinks about our house, she starts to cry. It was a beautiful house. They took everything that mattered to me. They didn't even leave me a picture of my children. Ever since we fled to Lebanon three years ago, we've done nothing but suffer. When I went back to Syria once to see what had happened to our house, all that was left was a heap of ashes. There wasn't even a single piece of wood. Just a huge pile of ashes. When I walked around the streets, I saw a few people and a young man came towards me to say hello. But before he reached me, he was hit by a shell. It tore him apart. That happened before my very eyes.
I learned at an early age that you cannot take for granted that there is a place for you on this earth. I was born to an unmarried mother in Berlin and grew up in an orphanage in Poland. On my birthday, it was the 17th of January 1945, Hitler ordered all Germans to leave Poland. In the morning, my mother appeared at the orphanage and said, I want my child. We're fleeing Poland and it's easier to do so with a child. My mother took me by the hand and we went, with me pulling my birthday cake behind me on a sledge. The sky was blood red, illuminated by the fire of exploding shells. All around was the sound of artillery fire and guns. And then we were loaded onto a train, and one day the whole lot of us were taken as prisoners of war by Russians and Poles. That lasted for two years. One thing I remember in particular, and it's more the sound than anything else, is that when the women and children were asleep in the dormitories, we would hear the men, the soldiers, running up the stairs. And we knew what that meant. They were coming for the women. That sound is what I recall most vividly. We would lie there not knowing if we'd be chosen or not, because not all of us were. My mother was a bit older, and she knocked out a few of her teeth so she'd look even older. She had her own way of dealing with the constant threat. She would tell me to lie on top of her and scream like mad if they came near. And that's what I always did. But there was one situation that didn't go so well, and I was the one who was raped. And then one night my mother said to me, we'll die if we stay here. We're going to escape. I'll start with the youngest, Matthäus. Matthäus, starting tomorrow, you can go to kindergarten. Mariana, you'll start school tomorrow. At 10 past 8 in house 45, and the other three will attend an orientation class. A very warm welcome. My name is Martin Steinberg. I'm the pastor here in Friedland. You're safe here. You're in a peaceful country, a country that wants you to be here. This is a peaceful country where women have the same rights as men. Uh, 
Where different religions coexist and people live together, celebrate together and sing together regardless of whether they're Muslim, Christian or Jewish. If you look around Friedland, although it's a refugee camp, you won't find any walls, you won't find any barbed wire. It's like a village within a village and everything's accessible to everyone. The refugees participate in village life and many of the locals walk through the camp on their way to the train station. Nowhere here is out of bounds. And that's what makes the camp special. We don't just pay lip service to freedom, there is genuine freedom here. I was born in Syria. My father fled there from Palestine. We lived in Yarmouk. Then all hell broke loose. We were bombed. When the Free Syrian Army arrived, we fled. We crossed the Mediterranean in a dinghy. There were 56 refugees in the boat, women and children, men. Eventually, we reached international waters. While we were still at sea, we encountered an Italian ship, which then pulled our boat behind it for hours. We fell asleep. When we woke up, we'd reached land. The women and children were the first to leave the boat. Or rather, we were all moved to another boat that had a red and white flag with a cross on it. We thought it was a Red Cross boat. But once we were all on board, it returned to sea, and we all had no idea what was happening. We were terrified it was taking us to Libya. That would have been a disaster. But we landed on Malta, which we thought was okay. We knew Malta was Europe. We all got into buses. There were a lot of camera teams and people standing around clapping. We felt welcome. But then we were taken to a police station. It was different there. The general public made us feel welcome, but the police beat us. We were all put in jail, even the families with children. In jail, some people tried to kill themselves. One man took his bedsheet and tied it to the ventilator and tried to hang himself. We got him down. They took him to the hospital. He was admitted to a psychiatric ward. Another man, his name was Muhammad al Atta, drank liquid chlorine. I remember his name. Muhammad al Atta. Someone else set his bed on fire late one evening. We were locked in. We pounded away on the cell doors. We were afraid we would suffocate. Finally, the firemen came, and we were screaming, open the doors, we have to get out and into the yard. The next day, our noses and throats were full of smoke and soot. They didn't let us out. All they did was open the windows. Everything is different here in Germany. Life is completely different. The way you treat it is different. I'll never go back to Malta. I would rather return to Syria. When I was in jail in Malta, my daughter wrote something on Facebook about fleeing from one death to another. The prison on Malta is called Safi One.
The journeys that people undertake before they arrive here are very different. Those who pay people smugglers a lot of money to get them out of their homeland reach Germany via third countries. That could be Greece or Italy, maybe Bulgaria or Romania, countries that are known to treat refugees abysmally. But once people have been registered in those countries, in other words, they've left their fingerprints there, then it can happen that German authorities tell them that they can't stay in Germany, but they have to go back to the first EU country of entry. Einen schönen guten Morgen. Ich bin Ihre Lehrerin. Lehrerin. Deutschlehrerin. Ich heiße Asiel. Wie heißen Sie? Ich heiße Lotta. Sehr gut. Klasse. Sie? Wie heißen Sie? Ich heiße Mendin. Mhm. Stellen Sie bitte Frage. Ich heiße Sie. Wie? Ja. Wie? 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 Heiße. Ich heiße wie? 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 Ich heiße wie? Nein, 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 Caroline. Ach man, stellen Sie die Frage. Er heißen. Wie? Wie? Heißen? Heißen. Sind Sie? Ich heiße Jubrail. Jubrail. Okay, Jubrail. Nehmen Sie Ihre Buchstaben. Ihre Buchstaben. Ja? Kommen Sie alle nach vorne. Nach vorne. Alle. Nach vorne. Mit Ihren Buchstaben, richtig? Ja? L. Gut. Mhm. Bilden Sie ein Wort. S, C, H. Wer hat S? Mustafa, buchstabieren. D. E. 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 U. 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 Und zusammen lesen Sie das Wort. Deutschland. Deutschland. Ja? Deutschland. 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 I'm very sad about what's happening in my country, but I'm grateful to Germany. Germany takes in so many refugees. I thank Germany with all my heart. I know we cost Germany a lot of money. My other children are arriving next month. What matters most to me is that we can all stay together. I hope we'll all be sent to the same part of Germany. I hope my children will be close to me. I've always had my children close by. This is the first time we've been so far apart. My journey came to an end in 1947, when I arrived in Friedland. We were given an exuberant welcome, like we were returning home. But I didn't have the faintest idea what home was supposed to be. I was used to living in camps. So it didn't feel as though I'd come home, nor did it feel like anywhere special or that we were free. I just wondered how long we'd stay.
All my mother and I had when we arrived were our rucksacks. I remember that all the other new arrivals looked really sick, destitute and starving. The huts were terribly crowded. But we still had the feeling that we were safe, that our journey was over. Once you were registered, you were given an ID card that you hung around your neck that identified you as a refugee. That meant you'd come from a long way away and were entitled to be in Germany. It was a strange feeling. Shortly after arrival, the refugees were sent one by one to see the doctor. He was such a friendly doctor. I remember him well. He worked in one of the huts with a nurse. He was very kind and, of course, he asked me what my name was and how old I was. My mother told him I had typhoid and dysentery and scabies. I could see that he felt sorry for me. Then he told me that I had to cut my hair because I had pustules all over my head and that didn't work so well with lice. But despite all the confusion, there was a sense of trust and protection. I was born in February 1944 in Missouria in East Prussia. One day the news arrived that women with small children had to leave. And during the transport, my mother fell ill. No one expected her to die, but she did. Because my grandmother and my aunt and I had to continue the journey, we buried her then and there. And I remember Friedland. There were a lot of women sitting behind boxes of index cards, and names would be called out, and the women would shake their heads. And then someone said the word orphan. And everyone looked at me strangely. They would look sympathetic. Some of them would stroke my hair or cry. But I didn't even know what an orphan was. Was das Wort weise heißt. Dann gingen wir then we went into a barracks, where there were lots of old clothes. And my grandmother picked out something for me to wear. Later, when we no longer lived in Friedland, but in the neighboring village, we'd visit the camp with a handcart to pick up old clothes. I remember that as one of the most humiliating experiences of my life. Going back home with old clothes in our handcart. I hated going back to the village. I always felt all the people were at their windows, twitching their curtains and watching us. Thank you. 
Madame, yeah, I have something different. A moment, Ich erinnere mich daran, dass im Dorf hier und da Geschichte I remember that now and again there was talk in the village about men returning. Die kommen eben nach Frieden and that there would be prisoners of war among them. Gefangene dabei. One day someone asked my grandmother why she didn't go along to see if anyone she knew was among them. And she said, none of ours is ever coming back. And I thought to myself, well, who knows? My father was only reported missing. If there were new people arriving, I wanted to go and see them. I picked a bunch of flowers and decided to ride my bike over there and welcome my father with them. And then I saw them coming. They arrived in trains, then buses. They waved and were so happy. The women ran alongside the buses and gave them flowers. I sat in a tree to wait. I was certain I would recognize my father. I had a photograph of him that I'd found in the suitcase we took when we left East Prussia. So there I was, convinced I'd recognize him. I'd go up to him with my bunch of flowers. And all of a sudden there they were, hundreds of men, rows and rows of them, up to five rows of them. I looked at all of them. I went up to each and every one to get a good look. I was so sure I'd recognize him or that he'd recognize me. I expected him to come forward at any minute. He'd see me and take me in his arms. But no one did. I remember seeing a little boy running up to one of the men, shouting, Daddy, Daddy. I thought it would be my turn next. But it wasn't. And then at some point, there was no one left. I remember I stayed there a long time until it got dark. Friedland is like a gateway to freedom that you go through without even knowing what freedom is. All the people who pass through here over the decades will have had a similar experience. They came here and could move about freely without a sentry standing guard, the way there always was in Russia. This freedom and the warmth we were shown took some getting used to. We were housed in these Nissen huts. They're exactly as I remember them. 
und das große, das, der große Auflauf. It was hier, always so crowded, äh, there especially. Hier, da standen also viele. There would be all these people standing and waiting for their relatives, their husbands, their sons. They'd be asking the men, where have you come from? Did you know a Franz Müller? And here are the women who peeled potatoes. I remember them. They made sure we all had something to eat. This picture here, this is very moving. It says that when I left Tbilisi in early July 1947, I weighed 48.6 kilos. You can imagine what I looked like. Friedland was a whole new world for us. There were all these people who welcomed us. They talked to us and gave us coffee or tea or something else to drink. They found us a place to sit down so we could have something to eat. We felt as though we'd landed on another planet. The contrast to what we'd known before was so immense. I'll never forget how it felt as long as I live. Bis ans Ende seiner Tage wird man das nicht vergessen. Man ist ja We floated around here like we were in a dream. We couldn't believe it was real. We touched things and say, is this really happening? angefasst und hat gesagt, ist das wirklich so? Ask her why she was a refugee in Germany when she's German. He wants to know how come you were a refugee here in Friedland, even though you're German. That's how it was in 1945. Hitler had me deported to Poland. So we did come here as Germans, but we were East Germans. We came from the other side. We were refugees, and no one wanted us. People here were afraid. There were millions of us in those years. Silesia and East Prussia had become part of Poland, so we had to flee. She's German, but felt like a foreigner here. After 1947, Germany sowed the seeds of change, and now they're reaping the benefits. But we Arabs are still experiencing today what you experienced back then. He says you were here in 1947, but that things in Germany have improved. People have changed, the political situation has changed, but nothing has changed for us. The situation has gotten worse. We're still going through what you went through in 1945. I agree with you. But what angers me are situations like those in Malta. We Europeans, including we Germans, 
aren't doing enough. We've forgotten what it was like. It's shocking that such a terrible place exists in Malta and on other borders, and even in Germany, that there are camps that don't even come close to this one. Life is good for us, and I'm angry at my own country that we aren't taking more people in. We could take in more. That's what I think, as a German who was once a refugee herself. I'm Pakistani. I had terrible problems in Pakistan. I left Pakistan because I no longer felt safe there. I was in constant danger. I spoke to a people smuggler about getting to Greece. We walked all day and all night. Along the way, they beat us like animals. If someone couldn't go on, they'd be beaten so they'd keep going. One night, we had to cross a mountain. When you saw the mountain in daylight, it was hard to believe it was possible. That's why it's best to cross mountains in the dark, so no one can see how dangerous it is. I was traveling with a friend. I don't know how it happened, but he slipped and fell. I went down to him. I could see that he was badly injured. He was bleeding heavily and couldn't get up. I wanted to help him, but the people smuggler hit me and told me to leave him there. We walked across fields along the border between Turkey and Greece. Then we reached a river. The smuggler told us he had a dinghy, which we would use to cross the water. We asked him if he was coming with us, and he said no, his job was to get us only that far. It was a really big river, and there was a strong current. Some of us could swim, but others couldn't. We took turns blowing up the rubber dinghy. Twenty-six of us got in that boat. In the middle of the river, the dinghy started twisting and rocking, and water began to get in, and the boat began to sink. We all jumped into the water. Those who could swim made it to the other side. Three didn't make it. We lost them. When I meet children in Friedland today, whether they come from Syria or Lebanon or wherever, I see myself in them. Then I have to ask myself if these little girls, these little six- or seven-year-olds, will ever get the chances I was given. 
Once you've been uprooted, is it possible to put down new roots? What can we, the ones who managed it, do for these people so that they succeed too? I come from Russia. I grew up in a German-speaking village. We spoke a German dialect at home. It was a small German community. And my parents always dreamt about moving to Germany one day. But it wasn't something that I ever really thought about. I was happy and content in Russia. But in 1991, my parents decided to move here. Majid is not there. Where is the music? All the kids are playing. Hello, hello. Schön, dass du da bist. Hello, hello. Schön, dass du da bist. Die Hacken und die Spitzen, die Wolle. The children only stay with us for five days. That's not very long. But even in those five days, we can see how much they change. Parents have shown us drawings their children made of masked men with weapons, and they told us how much that upset them. One family said they still never get undressed because they think it's still like in Syria and they could be bombed at any minute. But slowly they start to live normal lives again. And at some point the children start to draw happier pictures with flowers or something cheerful. Not so shocking. Gelb. 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 No, la. Gelb. Gelb. Yeah, bravo. In 1991, I thought I would never come back to Friedland. Those seven days were such a shock to my system. I don't think I understood anything that was going on. I always had a headache. I had to figure things out and couldn't really grasp how different everything was here. To begin with, even though I could speak German, I couldn't understand anyone. I think that happens, that you don't understand anything anymore. It's so unfamiliar, like losing your way in a forest. You're completely disoriented. When I see people arriving here, I have a sense that they also have headaches, just like I did. I know how they feel. They feel the way I did back then. I'm so restless. I can't sleep. I just want to find somewhere quiet to be with my children. I can't ever go back to Afghanistan. I left my first husband without getting divorced. In Afghanistan, the punishment for that is stoning. Oh. 
I was forced to marry when I was 15. There was a huge age difference, 35 years. That's why I left. Later, I met my second husband. He's the father of my children. I married him in secret. That's why we fled to Europe. I lived in Norway for three years. One night the police came to our door. It was three or four in the morning. We were asleep. It was a shock, especially for me and my eldest daughter. The police told us we had ten minutes to get ready to leave. Until the minute that they came and took us, we couldn't really believe what was happening. When we were sitting in the plane back to Afghanistan, I fell apart. My first husband is very powerful. He would have been able to find me anywhere in Afghanistan. I was in a terrible state. I was convinced that my life and the lives of my family were in danger. We were afraid to leave the house. I could have been spotted by relatives of my first husband. I fled Afghanistan again with my second husband. He's still in Turkey. My children and I were given a very warm welcome here. My strength is returning. I feel optimistic. I hope we'll be able to stay. That was 69 years ago. We were in those corrugated steel huts over there. I remember how we would sit on the beds. It was all such a novel experience. But we all sat on those bunk beds together. It's very moving to see it all again. But times have changed. This became my area of expertise. I was a university professor. Friedland has a very good reputation as a refugee camp, which is partly thanks to people like you. I love the term transit camp. It spells out that life for refugees is about moving on. A transit camp should be a place of security amid the chaos of fleeing, the drama of what you've experienced. That was certainly how I felt. It's a space, a buffer zone, where you can gather your thoughts and think about where you want to go, where you're allowed to go. It's a place where someone gives you something to eat, a bed to sleep in, a roof over your head, helps you sort out your papers and everything you need in order to move on. My name, My name is Johanna Heil. I'm a Caritas counsellor. I'm sure you all have lots of questions about your children who are still in Lebanon. It's about my daughter. She's married and lives in Jordan. She spent two days waiting on the border to get back in. Two days? We want her to come here. She wasn't allowed to re-enter the country. She had to go back to Damascus. She wanted to say goodbye to us all before we left. She came on her own. An officer promised her she'd be able to enter the country again in a week's time. 
Her daughter flew from Jordan to Lebanon to say goodbye, and now they won't let her back in. I can understand that you're very worried about your daughter. You don't know what's going on, and you're concerned that she's on her own in a complicated situation. She says it might be her fault. She just wanted to say goodbye, and now her daughter can't go home. I just want my family to be together and lead a normal life. That's all I want. A place where we can be safe. Somewhere to live. I want our children to get an education. We want them to go to school. Thank God I'm still strong enough to work. I hope our children have an opportunity to go to school. They've lost so many years. I hope that my eldest son can come here with his wife. He was less fortunate than we were. I hope he can get here. When my wife thinks of our eldest son, she cries all night. I hope we can get help in bringing him here. He wasn't one of the lucky ones. We only just arrived in Germany. So far, everything we've seen has been wonderful. We were given a very kind, warm welcome. Everyone says good morning to us. Everyone smiles at us. No one looks as though they resent us. People smiling at us makes us feel welcome. The people who arrive in Friedland have fled conflicts. It's shocking to see the faces of refugees coming from places like Eritrea. Young people, young men, young women traveling alone. They have long journeys behind them. They've made their way here across the African continent and crossed the Mediterranean from northern Africa. The trip is dangerous, and they're probably tied up with shady people smugglers who they are forced to rely on in their bid to apply for asylum in Germany. You can't make an application from outside Europe. You have to enter Europe illegally. There's no way to apply for asylum from outside Europe. Where did you stay in Libya when you were traveling on your own? I stayed at a farm in Abu Zalim where a lot of other people from Eritrea and Somalia were living, people from Nigeria and Ghana too. One day I got a job. A man showed up and told me I could clean his mother's house for 50 dinar a day. I went with him. We drove a long way, and at some point I didn't know where we were anymore. We were no longer on the main road. We stopped. There were only two black men there. No mother. The man who'd driven me there was white, so there were three men. 
They told me to take off my clothes. I told them I was there to work, that I didn't need to take off my clothes to work. Then one of them hit me. I cried, but no one could hear me. One of the dark-skinned men kept hitting me. He beat me senseless. I took my headscarf to cover myself up. They said to me, don't act as though you were a woman. You're nothing. Your death would mean nothing. Then they took my headscarf and used it to tie my hands together. I couldn't feel anything anymore. Were you unconscious? Yes, they blindfolded me. I was powerless. There were three of them. I lost track of time. I don't know if I regained consciousness that day or the next. Then they took me to another farm with African refugees. It wasn't the same one I'd been at before. They left me lying outside it. I don't know how long I was there. Then people found me. They put me in a room, but no one dared touch me. For months I didn't know what was going on around me. Later I realized I was pregnant. All the refugees there wanted to get away, to Europe. I gave all my savings to people smugglers. They took us to Italy. Then I paid more smugglers to take me to Germany. The other refugees knew that I didn't have any money left. But they helped me. They collected money for me. There are still good people in the world. There was a lot of good. When I was in such a bad state, I just wanted to die. I could only think about the problems. But then I began to hope things would get better. Nothing will happen to you here in Germany. You're safe. No one can hurt you. I will raise this child. It was a traumatic experience, but it's not the child's fault. Will you be able to love the child? I hope so. Wie geht's Ihnen? Wie geht's Ihnen? Wie geht's Ihnen? Wie geht's Ihnen? Gut. Danke. Ja? Nein. Frage, noch einmal. Stellen Sie die Frage. Sehr gut, 95 geboren, klasse, super. Wo wohnen Sie? Ich wohne in Greta. Gut. Mhm. An alle? Okay, okay, sehr gut. Noch einmal, bitte. I always thought Germany was a beautiful country. I love to watch German football. I'm crazy about it. 
I always want Germany to win. Go Germany! The goalkeeper pulls a face like a tiger when he dives for the ball, just like a tiger. I really like Germany. I never dared dream I'd come here one day. The dogs in Syria, they bite. <laughs> They're not pets and honestly not very nice. No, they're not nice. And they're dirty. I'm afraid of them. Here we've seen dogs with special hairdos. People here bathe their dogs and take them to the doctor. We don't do that. This is a lovely country. The people are nice. We had fun on today's outing. Friedland is a very peaceful place. I've been here 22 days and have been very happy. I just got my transfer papers. I'm being moved tomorrow. I'm a bit worried about what will happen next. I hope I'll be granted asylum here. When I talk to the other refugees here in Friedland about how they were persecuted and the difficulties they've had, then I feel that my own problems are relatively minor in comparison. Everyone has a story to tell. Every story is full of suffering and sorrow. <laughs> Ich gebe Ihnen 
jetzt die I am now going to tell you the places you're being sent. I wasn't the one who chose them. They were decided by representatives in the states where you'll be going. Let's start with Jibreil. You're going to Wiesau. Let me show you where it is on the map. It's east of Bayreuth. Bayreuth is the nearest big city. You'll be leaving tomorrow at 8 in the morning. All the other families are being sent to a town called Breitenbrunn in Saxony. It's south of the city of Chemnitz. Abdel Al-Aziz Al-Husari. Kanaz Al-Habal. Mustafa Mayazi. Hello, Mariana. How are you? You leave Sultan tomorrow and you'll go to Oldenburg. Yeah. Yes, I train to tomorrow. Learn. You'll go have a breakfast and then yes. the bus will come and you'll say bye bye Friedland. <laughs> <laughs> no, I come again, Friedland. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Wunderbar. All the best for you. Thanks a lot. We've heard that some people in Saxony don't like Arabs and that we'd be better off someplace else. But a friend of mine told me that Saxony is lovely and that I shouldn't listen to the others. He's been here for 27 years. And he says, believe me, Germans are the same all over the country. They all treat you the same. Don't be put off, he said. People say all sorts of things. Maybe people in Saxony are the nicest. We hope so. They're no different from people here. I'm sure they're the same. In a talk yesterday, we heard that Article 1 of German Basic Law says that human dignity is inviolable. That's why I can't believe that if it says that in the Constitution, that people will treat others badly. I can't imagine that. It was good to hear. People come before all else. Danke für jedes gute Wort. Danke, dass deine Hand mich leiten will an jedem Ort. Dear sisters and brothers, Many of you are looking forward to tomorrow. You've learned that you'll be transferred to Saxony, Baden-Württemberg, Bavaria. You're probably wondering what awaits you there. Where will you live? Where will your children go to school? Will you get a job? Will you learn the language? And you'll meet people who will show you the same kindness that you've experienced in Friedland. Friedland. 
خلوا وجهكم ضحوك خلي علاقتكم كويس خلي علاقتكم طبيعه مع الاخرين But you might also meet people who are less kind There are people in Germany who are afraid of foreigners who stir up anger against you and your friends ممكن انتم تلاقوا ناس ما بتلي ولا مثله في ناس كمان احيانا بيكون وجهكم عابس لا تزعجوا It will be an exciting time for you You're heading into the future but looking back at the past because, of course, your hearts and minds are still in your homelands and with the people who can't be here beside you. What I wish for you is that you can follow your path in peace and safety. It's been known to happen that people leave Friedland at 8 in the morning, but then call us at 5 in the afternoon from Schleswig-Holstein or Saxony, saying, please come and get us, because the accommodation they've been given is inhumane. That does happen. The way it's done in Saxony is that everyone is housed together in one place, in holiday homes or guest houses. With kitchens? Of course. They're all self-contained units. Many have told us that they have family members coming on the next flights, and we've passed that on. I know that family is very important in your cultures and that naturally you want to be together, and we can always strive for this in the long term. So no need to worry yet. It's never rained like this before. Someone must be very sad that you're all going. We're crying too, for our people, our homes. You're all really good friends, even though you've only just got to know each other. But here you do bond somehow. You're not alone. Look, everyone's going with you. I hope I'll see my children again, that they can join me. I hope you get everything you wish for too. I hope things go well for you. Let's hope. We're making fun of poor Amer. He hasn't slept since yesterday. When we arrived in Friedland, he fell in love with her straight away. He said to me, look at that girl. I told him, she is beautiful, but she is Christian. But he only had eyes for her. He fell in love with her, and she fell in love with him. And then it started with WhatsApp. What's, what's, what's? Are you sad that she's going to a different state? Of course. Do you want to marry her? Would that be possible? Here, yeah, anything is possible. Everyone is equal. Can you read my future? Sure, you'll see. Drink up your coffee first. Will you always love her? For all eternity? 
Really? Yes, really. <laughs> As his father, I welcome the idea. I would be happy for him. She's a good person. Take a look. Something will happen. There might be problems. I'm ready for them. Do you see it? Take a look. But how does it end? The end looks all white. I don't know. Only God knows. But I see good signs. I see Friedland, land of peace, as a metaphor, and not just because of the name. It has a message that we have to be a land of peace, one that takes in people fleeing very different, perilous situations and treats them humanely. I think Friedland has a very important function to make Germans realize you were at war once too and you were taken in. And I think this is the big lesson that anyone, from one moment to the next, can lose even the ground beneath their feet. And there is no greater harm one can inflict on humanity than to close the door on people.